I want to just give you a few seconds on the comparison project, uh, which is a global philosophy of religion as it, as it exhibits or manifests itself in the Des Moines area. The comparison project, as many of you know, is partially a lecture and dialogue series, which you are part of tonight. And in addition to that, there is a, a, a section of it that is looking at the religions of Des Moines, of all of the different, in all of the marvelous diversity of the religions in Des Moines. There's an online guide for those of you who are interested, um, a series of digital stories, and in about a year and a half, we're gonna be covering, uh, publishing a, uh, you can call it a picture book, a photo essay, but looking at how all of the different um, religions in Des Moines function. The comparison project is funded by seven different sources for which we are very grateful. One of them is the Drake Center for the Humanities, uh, Drake's principal financial group, group center for global citizenship, the Medbury Fund, Humanities Iowa, the Des Moines Area Religious Council, Cultivating Compassion, which is the Richard Deming Foundation, um, and Isles Funeral Home. Um, I noticed, I was very pleased to notice that a lot of you were signing in. Um, Humanities Iowa encourages us to sign in so we can demonstrate what we're doing with their money. Um, so if you didn't sign in before, we'd love it if you'd sign in afterwards. Um, if you want more information on the Comparison Project, we have a website, there's information out on the table. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Just so that you will know for tonight, uh, the format is that we are going to spend about an hour on the panel discussions, and then we will open it up for questions. The, the assumption is that we will allow about 30 minutes, but if people have more questions than that, we'll hang out until you get your questions answered. Um, we are recording tonight, and so I would ask you, when you have a question, raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone around to you so that it will be captured. Um, and we would ask you, if you would, to be concise and to speak directly into the microphone. Uh, one final point, um, the, the opinions expressed tonight are by a group of very wise men, um, <laughs> but they are their opinions and not necessarily the Comparison Project or IELTS. Um, lastly, I want to thank um, the supporters of this project. Um, who are here tonight. Um, Tim Nepper, for those of you who have not met him, he is standing in the doorway. We would not be here without him. Um, he, is the, he is the creator of, of the Comparison Project. Um, other supporters, you can raise your hand. Uh, Leah Kalmanson, who is on the faculty at Drake. Kayla Jenkins, who makes everything we do simply possible. Um, and Isaiah Enixon, who is a research assistant. And I would like to give special thanks, above all, to Robin um, for their generosity in providing the space tonight, but also their generosity in providing advertising for tonight's event. And I just, out of curiosity, I would love to see a show of hands. How many of you have heard the plug on Iowa Public Radio? Cool. Very cool. Okay. So now I'm going to get down to business. We'll get on to the real stuff. All right. Uh, what I'd first like to do is introduce our moderator, Norman Her Norma Hirsch. Um, she is assistant professor in the Department of Behavioral Medicine, Medical Humanities, and Bioethics at Des Moines University, where she directs the cu curriculum in ethics. Prior to that, she served as vice president and chief medical officer of HCI Services, which many of us know as Hospice of Central Iowa. She was director of Variety Club Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at Blank Children's Hospital, and before that, president of Heartland, Heartland Bioethics Center. Um, she has completed extensive seminary training for lay persons, including the core curriculum for physicians and death and dying. Uh, looking at our panelists, starting from right to left, I guess, okay. Uh, Dr. Bin Yu is a professor of Christianity at Minzu University in China, and he is the director of Comparative Scripture and Interreligious Dialogue. Over the past 20 years, he has been engaged in interpreting the Bible
from a Chinese perspective. He is currently a Fulbright visiting scholar at Fuller Theological Seminary in California, where his focus is on integrating the Taoist and Confucian spiritual heritages into Christianity. Dr. Yu will bring the perspective of Chinese religions to tonight's discussion. Uh, okay, Dr. Joseph Moravec. Uh, Dr. Moravec is a professor of theology and philosophy on the faculty of Mercy Health <coughs> College of Health Sciences. He is also an ordained minister, having served in three different Christian traditions. He received his Doctor of Ministry from Trinical Evangelical Divinity School in Illinois in 1993. He's done extensive, extensive work on the healing ministry of Jesus Christ as reflected in the New Testament and will bring the Christian perspective to our discussion tonight. Dr. Ma Dr. Pramod Mahajan is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Drake. He received his PhD in biochemistry in India and came to the U.S. in 1982. He is particularly interested in cultural and educational activities in Iowa and has frequently worked as a facilitator and advocate for Hindus who find it challenging to align their traditional rituals and beliefs with the American way of life, particularly those related to death and dying <coughs> as part of the American medical and legal systems. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Saeed Hussein. He's a board certified pediatrician working on a semi-retired basis at the West Des Moines Children's Clinic. He is particularly interested in working with handicapped children. Pretty previously, he was medical director at ChildServe and director of Woodward State Hospital. Dr. Hussein has been interested in comparative religion since his teens and tonight we'll provide an Islamic perspective on the question of death and dying. And at this point, I'm gonna get out of the way and turn it over to Norma. Thanks, Mary. So let's get on to the dialogue. Um, we have three questions for the panelists and I'm just gonna pose a question and then we'll just start with you, Dr. Yu, and you can just, the others can follow along after you. And the first question is, will you give us a brief overview of how death and dying is understood in your tradition? Thank you, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be here, and it's my great honor. Uh, so I just thought that uh, I, as the youngest one, I should not speak first. <laughs> in your Chinese tradition, yeah, I have this consciousness. But uh, I, I will follow the way uh, you you ask me uh, to do here. Well, uh, I will uh, answer the question. Should I uh, just answer the first question or right. or the whole three questions? The, huh? the the first question, the overview okay. of death and dying in your tradition. Okay. Uh, so, uh, for Chinese religion, uh, death and uh, all this ritual system uh, with death is very important system in the Chinese culture. So uh, the term I use here about uh, Chinese religion, I include all this uh, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. But all these three different religions provide rituals at the separate level, and, but in a complementary way. So deeply inf reflecting the inclusivism and the uh, complementary Mess of Chinese religion. So the three religions are both take part in uh, providing the ritual service for a single person, not in a uh, not ex exclusive, which is other, but in a complementary way. Because uh, for the Chinese religion, the basic understanding about the human soul that there are three parts of uh, of human soul. One is so called a heavenly soul, and one is called a earthly soul and one is called a human soul. So uh, both the three souls uh, are part of, are derived from something ultimate, nothingness, and it belongs to the spiritual sphere of life. And when a person uh, is dead, so the three souls go to the different parts of the world. The, the heavenly soul go to the heaven to be united with the uh, gods and will be guided uh, will be guarded by the God. 
But the earthly uh, soul will go to the hell, uh, follow the retribution to be, pun uh, to be published, to be punished or rewarded, or follow the way, the cycle of rebirth into other lives. For example, uh, to become another kind of animal or become a kind of another life uh, higher than human beings. So uh, based on this doctrine, Buddhist monk and the Taoist priest play the role of the spiritual guide to help the earthly soul through the proper place or even can release the diseased soul from the hell. So a uh, Buddhist monk uh, or the Taoist priest play some role in kind of guiding the earthly, the, the part of earthly soul to into a proper path. But the, have, uh, the human soul will be just a stay in this world, in this earthly life, and would it be the godly, uh, would it be the godly uh, agent in the ancestor label after being handled with proper ritual. They will become the spirit worshiped, worshiped by the offspring, and they would bless the clan and the family if they are venerated properly. And they have kind of special <coughs> spiritual power, and if properly uh, venerated, it can bless the, uh, the family. But if not properly venerated, they would bring bad fortune to the family or clan. So at the, uh, in the level, uh, in the sphere of life practice, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism cooperated together and forming a kind of a comprehensive ritual for death or the funeral. So, uh, uh, and uh, it reflected as a kind of system of ancestral worship. And it is not only a ritual happened in the funeral, it can be roughly divided into two, uh, four phases. The first one uh, is at the point of near to death. And then the second phase is the preparation for the funeral altar. And then in the funeral service, in the funeral, uh, burial service. So, but after the burial, uh, burial service, there are a system of sacrifice after the funeral, and there is a kind of annual veneration in specific, uh, in, uh, specific festivals. So I think I am long out of the, my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. I am honored to be here tonight and to be next to my uh, fellow panelists, who's this is the first time in Iowa, and I think uh, I'm excited to meet you. Welcome thank to you. Iowa. Oh, thank uh, you. Your president was here before you. Uh, <laughs> so, so I have a great relationship. Anyway, I'm honored to be here tonight. And you know, it's really difficult, Norma, to try to summarize. You got 2.2 billion people who are Christians. And uh, there's such a diversity among the religion. And I know you, you're kind of spanning three different religions. And mm -hmm. it's hard to summarize what is norma normative or what is typical. And uh, But Christianity, you know, 80% uh, uh, of uh, you know the largest religion, eighty percent of Americans would say they would be Christians, and we have one point six million here in Iowa, and most uh, the majority being Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, and you can go on and on, and then you have your heterodoxical sects and, and, and traditions like Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses. So it's kind of hard to be normative, but I'm going to try to speak to that uh, uh, that aspect, and it's, uh, it's challenging, but. I think Christians generally uh, believe in the sanctity of human life, that life is, is a gift from God, and that a, a person is made up of two parts, a material part and an immaterial part. The material part would be that which would be in the Genesis account, would say uh, that God created man and woman from man, especially from dust of the earth, and he breathed his suke, his life, into that. And uh, so that was the creation of man. So there's a material part, and an immaterial part. The immaterial part would be consisting of spirit and soul. And so there's kind of, a, it's hard to distinguish between two, that's just the real person. And so that would be really uh, a, a definition. Women, of course, are a, an upgrade from men. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they were created from the rib, you know, on the side, not a foot bone, but it's way. So very important to know that we're equal and God 
uh, both have his image. And so, uh, in terms of Christianity, but most would embrace a Trinitarian understanding that God is one person, yet three persons. And basically, it's hard to understand. It is a mystery. Uh, we could, but that's what the revelation uh, basically uh, is, is you know, revealing to us. So that's what the scriptures say. It's not too hard to agree you know, and to understand three things that are all whole and being one. It's not a one plus one plus one equals three. Uh, if you look at one times one times one equals one. So I mean, so we understand the Trinitarian, and that's pretty much how it's revealed in Scripture. Most Christians would embrace that. Um, suffering and death would be consequences of sin. Sin would be uh, end of the world through the account that most would believe, whether myth mystical or mythical or actually uh, a real account, uh, Adam and Eve sinning uh, in the garden. And that death is part of that consequence, and that there's three types of death. There's physical death, which is separation from the material and immaterial part. Uh, but it's separation, not cessation. Now, there are one or two different traditions of Christianity, mostly heterodoxical, would say that a person, when they die, they cease to exist. And that'd be a cessationist view. Uh, but the majority of Christianity would say, no, death is separation. So when a person dies, you have the material part, which Isle's funeral home is very good at taking care of, and then you have the other part that, that uh, goes, uh, we would say, has an immortality. When a person is born, they are immortal. God is eternal, and he has other characteristics as well, some of which he shares with us, but immortality would be what a human being would have. And they would be, so there's physical death, second death would be a spiritual death, and that is we're separated from, our, from God in our relationship. We are made in his image, yet, but we're separated from him because of sin. And the third death would be eternal death, which would be everlasting separation from God. And immortality of the soul and the spirit in that, it'll either, there's really two main options, hell or heaven, although the Catholics would believe in a purgatory, which would be kind of a purging time for those who are destined to heaven, that they're being purged for their, of their sins so that they may be adequate for heaven. But majority would be basically heaven or hell. Jesus Christ would be considered God's son. He's a divine healer. We see that in his earthly ministry. Um, and the baptism and Eucharist, or Lord's Supper, is kind of the key litmus test in terms of determining which tradition is which. Prayers and anointing of the sick are very important before, at, and after death. Uh, and scripture reading for many of the traditions. A priest, pastor, ordained deacon, or lay person would be an efficient, proper efficient, again, depending upon the tradition. Some are very adamant, like Catholic and Orthodox, would be definitely the Eucharist or the sacraments can only be administered by ordained priest or bishop. Uh, uh, embalming uh, is typical, uh, probably more so, although uh, some would uh, choose cremation uh, as an option. Uh, they utilize mortuaries like uh, Isle's Funeral Home and there would be typically a mass or a funeral or memorial service, as well as possibly even a great side ceremony. So that's, that's kind of a summary. I think I gave you a, a little bit to chew on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as we left last time talking about the properties of enzymes. Oh, yep. wrong glass. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to emphasize, in case you didn't notice it from the introduction, <laughs> that I am the Arbala. <laughs> um, uh, I'm really, truly honored uh, for uh, being a part of this uh, wonderful gathering and, and this uh, expert panel uh, of religions. Um, I'm, I'm in it to just learn. And I'll share whatever I little know about uh, Hinduism, and uh, hopefully uh, we will all learn more tonight. So um, to, to specifically answer the question uh, that Nama has posed, uh, one thing about Hindu religion uh, that most of you probably already know is that it is a not a monolithic religion. And if you think Christianity is diverse, um, <laughs> I, I need not uh, say uh, anything more than that. Uh, <laughs> is, the one thing that is common to many Hindu uh, people spread across the globe is that there is very little that is common. Uh, but there are a few fundamental concepts that 
all Hindus believe in. And one of those is the existence of soul. All Hindu scriptures, the, the original Hindu scriptures, which are uh, defined as Vedas and Upanishadas, uh, define soul as something that is immortal. That is the part of God within the living beings. And it is neither created nor destroyed. It is indestructible. No force, no power can destroy the soul. Mm -hmm. Thus, it separates this immortal part from the mortal body that <coughs> we are, uh, are present in this universe. What dies is the mortal part. What remains is the soul. That is, I think, a very common belief just about everybody uh, in Hindu uh, religion believes in. The part about death and dying that is also somewhat common, not, not very commonly believed, but somewhat common, is the reappearance of that soul in a different form because it does, it does not die, it is immortal. Uh, it reincarnates itself into another life form. And, and uh, uh, there's a very nice couplet uh, in Bhagavad Gita uh, that talks about the immortality of the soul uh, that I might uh, quote just to show you that I know a little bit about my religion too. Um, it, it says, Nainan chindanti shastrani nainan dhati pavaka nachainam kledayam tyapo nashoshayati maruta. Simply means that soul is immortal. Uh, fire cannot burn it. Water cannot drown it. Air cannot blow it away. Or any other power cannot destroy it. Then how does this soul reincarnate itself? And there is also a very nice couplet about that. It says, Vasamsi jirnani yatha vihaya navani grannati navani de. Simply means, just as every morning we get up and change clothes, the soul changes bodies. From one incarnation to the next, from one body to the other, from one life form to the other. It continues its journey. <coughs> and then it and then the scriptures say that there is a um, path that this journey takes until this soul is liberated. What most of you have heard is the term nirvana. Nirvana simply means liberation. Once it is liberated, it becomes one with the superpower of God. Until that time, it keeps going through the cycle of life and death. And death is part of life. And it's simply a way for that soul to escape this mortal world and get back into this cycle. Um, uh, I might also take a few minutes, a few seconds, to, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about um, the uh, other rituals associated with it, but there is really nothing common. Uh, there are religion, uh, religious differences, there are regional differences, and there are differences literally within families. And so uh, that, that's all I will say about it as my time is ending. Okay. Thank you. No, Norma, this is a brief one or? This is the first part. First part, okay. First. You asked a question about Islam. First of all, sorry to disappoint you that I'm not wearing a long robe and a turban and a beard because I'm not an imam, I'm not a mullah, I'm just a pediatrician. <laughs> God interested in this. Just briefly, I'll tell you. When I was growing up, I grew up in an English boarding school and all my teachers were from Cambridge and Oxford and I knew about they were Christians but I grew up as a Muslim in the boarding school. I was curious, so one day I asked one of my teachers, can I come to church with you? She said, sure. So that helped opened up my mind, what's going on? I was 17, 
my aunt was big politician, so I used to drive her to the meetings. And I was getting bored, so I asked one of my teachers, so she gave me the Gideon Bible. So I read the Bible in the car in several hours. Then I got interested. I was in visiting one of my friends. The wife gave me the Hindu holy book, Ramayana. I got interested. Then I got into Bhagavad Gita, I got interested. That was, that's how I started reading religion. Because now when I came to United States, I was lucky to have befriended a priest and three rabbis. <laughs> so now I started you know, learning more and more, got more interested. So I started speaking about it. It's just fascinating. First of all, death and dying, as you know, is an emotional thing. For everybody, is emotion. So I'll leave that part later. But in Muslim, in Islamic doctrine, holds that human existence continues after death of human body in the form of spiritual and physical resurrections. That's the basic of Islam. Uh, God says this is going to happen, and every Muslim should be resurrected. Every human being will be resurrected. Then the decisions are made. That's our basic of Islam. Then I can go into a little more detail when the second comes. Thank you all very much. We think that that was pretty exceptional for giving you only five minutes. Um, <laughs> but if you thought that was hard, now we have another one. Oh, it's coming longer later. <laughs> <laughs> So our second question is, how have advances in medical technology affected or impacted traditional understandings and rituals and practices in your faith tradition, especially in the areas of things like life-saving technologies, like withholding or withdrawing medical interventions, mm -hmm. like death with dignity movements? Five minutes. <laughs> well, uh, to to answer the question about what effects has the medicalization of death has done on one's uh, traditional uh, understanding. So uh, I want to make two points. The first one is about uh, the organ donation. Because it's quite common with the advance of technology that uh, 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 some patient need some organ from the person who died. But uh, in the Confucian tradition that the body is not belongs to yourself. The body belongs to the family because the body was given by the parents and the parents' body given by the parents. So the body itself is not belongs to, to you. And uh, when a person is dead, so he needed to be united with the whole family in the spiritual world. So he needed to keep the body whole as a person who, who died. So, uh, uh, it is very hard if the person is in that tradition that uh, you should not hurt your body even uh, you are dead. So I think this is the first effect that the medicalization of death, of death nowadays uh, impact on the Confucian tradition. The second point I want to, ma uh, I want to make about the medicalization of death is about dying in the hospital. Because I do not have time to talk about uh, the uh, specific specific ritual uh, for the Confucian tradition, uh, so uh, all this uh, ritual about the death in Confucian tradition needed to be done in family. For example, when a person is going to die, he should not stay in the bedroom because bedroom is the private place. He should the family should move the the people near to death go to the living room, because the living room is the place the family paid the sacrifice to the ancestors. So, uh, but if, if a person is died in the hospital, it is not to, uh, not to talking about the differences between the living room and the bedroom, it is a difference <coughs> between a remote area and the family. So, uh, to, uh, so, uh, uh, so, and also, uh, for all the all these rituals, for the Chinese tradition, the family is always the focus of all the rituals. So, for a dead person, the family will not go to a Buddhist temple or the Taoist temple. 
But the Buddhist monk or the Taoist priest should go to the family to do all these kind of ritual because uh, the family is the center place rather than bring the, the body of the dead to a monk, uh, to a temple. So, uh, so uh, I think uh, the most important uh, effect about the medicalization is uh, uh, the hospital or the doctor should let the family bring the people near to death, near to death, go back to home. Uh, so this is the effect. Thank you. Well, I think in, in the Christian tradition, Christianity by and large is fairly aligned with modern biomedical model of healthcare. So uh, added, of course, the holistic spiritual side and dimension to it as well. Um, death is not feared. And as Christians, we don't fear death because uh, even though it is a uh, kind of a curse and, and that's the result of sin, but we must die to our physical body to have a resurrected body. That's one it's, that's immortal, that will never die. And that's one without pain and suffering and will not experience death. So it's really a blessing for the believer to have a new body, especially if they're going through intense pain and suffering. Um, it's almost, you know, I, we would cons many would consider an answer to prayer, that they are now uh, alleviated from that pain and suffering. Now they have uh, a new life, new body, and where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering. But God ultimately determines the time and occasion of one's death. Most Christians would say that uh, and would believe that. There, there are certainly uh, cert Christian alternatives that we would consider that might improve the quality of a person who's dying um, and will employ the best modern technology to save that person's life, but not necessarily to sustain it needlessly. Because we believe that God, again, is, we don't want to per perpetuate suffering. We don't want to create and, and cause life to go beyond what, what God would desire and what would be best for that person, as well as the family. So Christians will gladly accept palliative care and, and, and hospice uh, is a very important thing. It's kind of similar to bringing the person home to be with the family. I think that's, uh, that's, that's some, some similarities there, which is really great. And uh, for the quality of life and the support of the patient and the family, because that's important, uh, the compassionate side of that. And Christianity basically is following the model of Jesus Christ as the healer. And so we try to pattern our, our whole approach towards death and dying and care for uh, the patient and family in that tradition. Typically though, uh, euthanasia uh, or physician assisted suicide is, is forbidden and is not an option. And uh, typically, now there are a few that, that would maybe be advocates of that, but by and large, it's not. Because there we're, we're playing God, we're taking uh, a person's life and we're predetermining and choosing for that person when they should uh, pass on. Uh, there's a unique teaching though, and I don't know, a lot of people probably aren't aware of it, and I, my main tradition has been Protestant, although I've had, uh, my family members are Christian, my paternal grandparents were uh, Catholic, I mean, and my brother's Catholic, and I'm serving in a Catholic college, been there for 12 years teaching theology as a Protestant, so it's been an interesting experience, and uh, mercy, the Catholic tradition is very, they're very embracing, so I really enjoy that, and I've, and I've learned a lot. And one of the concepts that's been really strategic for me, and it, it's really, uh, theologically challenged some things and, and broadened my perspective, and that is the idea and concept of redemptive suffering. And uh, Pope John II really had put together a, quite a treatment on that, but I want to read this. Because we're a part of God through baptism and faith, and because we are sharing in his humanity, God has lifted human suffering to the level of redeeming, or that which saves. And we're using, again, Christ as an example. It's through his suffering that we are healed. Through his suffering, we are saved. And so for the Christian, Jesus is the only son of God and the only savior. At the same time, because we are part of him, we are called to help him in his mission of redemption. We can give him our pain and suffering to help the world. He will take our pain and bring good through it. We can be transformed. Most people I, uh, have through the pain uh, that they've experienced, but they've also had spiritual strength, greater faith, personal insight, and they may see what really is important in life. 
So we can give up our pain and suffering for the good of ourselves as well as for others. So uh, that's a concept I think that's pretty unique in Christianity that I've been exposed to, especially at Mercy. So. Uh, I, I think that um, applying uh, modern day concepts of medicine to a, uh, to a faith uh, or to a philosophy uh, that has existed uh, over 5,000 years uh, is rather difficult. Um, you're using a different yardstick to measure something that existed at a different time. And, and so um, what I, I try to do is, is look for examples, evidences that might help us understand the situation. I'm going to very briefly share an experience that I personally have uh, to convey the point that Hinduism is, I think, very open to all the known and yet to be known technologies uh, uh, to make sure that life is saved. Um, a while back, quite a while back, almost 15 years ago now, I received a call uh, from Mercy one day um, uh, the, the chaplain there wanted to uh, talk to me about a patient that they had who uh, said that he uh, had accepted Hinduism as a religion. He was born and brought up in Iowa. Accepted Hinduism as a religion. And uh, unfortunately for him, his kidneys were failing and uh, he was waiting for a transplantation. He was on the list for a transplantation. And they um, were convincing him to go through the transplantation. And he had this philosophical question. Um, I am a Hindu, and Hindus don't necessarily eat meat or uh, don't like um, to, to engage in um, things that will require blood and all that. And um, for some reason, he thought that if he g receives a organ transplant, that his chances of going to the heaven in the afterlife will diminish. And so he was very worried and he asked this question to the chaplain. And the chaplain, uh, for some reason, decided to talk to me. I, uh, um, I have no answer to that. Absolutely no answer to that. However, uh, being a true biochemist, <laughs> now, this is your chance to ask me questions about biochemistry. No. Um, um, what, what I thought was, uh, what, I, what, I, what I thought was, suddenly um, the, the image of God Ganesha came to my mind. For those of you who understand transplantation, God Ganesha has an elephant head and a human body. That's called a xenograph, not just an organ transplant from another human being, <coughs> but another species altogether. <laughs> and the scriptures are full of descriptions like this. And one of the ancient surgery texts that was written was part of Ayurveda. I think Hinduism accepts modern concepts really well. Uh, that we, we know about. Uh, one thing that Hinduism has uh, sort of uh, stayed away from and has shied away from is committing suicide. Because there are, again, evidences in the scripture that talk about committing suicide being cowardly. And so committing suicide is shunned. However, um, there, is a, there is a process called priopovation which simply means if a person has decided that he or she has achieved everything that he or she wanted to achieve in their current form of life, that they can choose to simply stop eating <coughs> and drinking and thus stop breathing eventually. And that, that was considered acceptable in the scriptures. So that's, that's sort of the um, uh, situation in Hinduism. Norma, I'm wondering what you and I are doing here. They're all grown up people. You are neonatologist, I'm a pediatrician. I think we are growing up. <laughs> uh, 
you talk about medical things, it's very interesting nowadays if you notice that slowly the death and dying is getting into the medical profession decisions. Not the priest, not the imams, or not. Slowly the doctors have been called in to get into this business of when to save, when not to save. Or the doctors are becoming more and more. So we are aware of this thing. One of the challenges of defining death is distinguishing from life. How do you distinguish from life? Are they dead? Are they not dead? How do you define it? Very challenging. In olden days, how do you know you are dead? My wife was reading uh, some novel and turned to me. She said, why do these people in the olden days used to put coins on the dying person's eyes? So I said, well, it was a simple reason. Because eye movements were taken. If the eye movements stop, you are dead. So they used to put the coins. And coming back to this afterlife, and they also used the coin in the mouth. Because everybody wants to go to heaven. I think everyone will go to heaven. So you have to buy your way to the heaven with that coin. Yeah. It's a very interesting concept. So same thing with the medical profession. We are trained to see death as a defeat and failure of our skills. If the patient dies, you know, uh, you have gone through it with the babies and we have gone through it with children, just sit there. It is so frustrating. Sometimes I used to sit at children's hospital, the sick child, and I used to curse myself. 35, 40 years you have been in practice. You don't know what the heck is wrong with this child. That is so frustrating. Mm -hmm. You sit there and see, wow, how do I not know this? So those are the very much challenges. Let me make a statement where you can argue about it. <laughs> All deaths are unnecessary, unwanted, and unwelcome. You can argue this point. A good death in which a person dies on his own terms, that's a good death. I want to die in my bed. I want to die at home. In the modern days, it's not happening. We are dying in hospitals. We want to die at home. That's a good death. At the root of the, de the de debate is what mistakes we fear most as a physician. The mistake of prolonging suffering or the mistake of sharpening valued life. What do we do? Now, you mentioned that, yes, we all want pain to be brief, I pray pain to be prolonged, uh, brief, and the pleasure to last long. That's our concept in doing that. Cessation of breathing, you're dead. Then the anxieties about death. One anxiety is called predate. Predatory anxiety, but a snake can bite you. A tornado can get you. That anxiety is there. Other anxiety is you are aware that you are going to die. So now you are anxious. How do you do it? So the medical field has slowly taken over. On the lighter side of all this, I have collected a few of the things from some books. Uh, you might enjoy it. Now, Julius Caesar, about death. It's strange that man should fear seeking that death, a necessary end will come when it will come. Death, this is a Turkish proverb, death is a black camel that kneels at every gate. There's one certainty in life that is sooner or later is going to end. Emily Dickinson, because I could not stop for death, it kindly stopped for me. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, there's the fullness of time when man should go and not occupy too long on the ground to which others have a right to advance. Vincent Churchill, on his 70th birthday, I am ready to meet my maker. Whether my maker is prepared for the ordeal of meeting me is another matter. 
The hour of departure has arrived. We go our way. I die, you live. Which is better? Only God knows. Woody Allen. You know Woody Allen? It's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it comes. <laughs> now, when I was going through all this, my wife said, what's your take in all this? I said, you know what? I'm getting old. I'm forgetting things. I might forget to die. <laughs> she looked at me and said, don't worry about, about it. I'll remind you. <laughs> I don't think that's just a Muslim tradition either. <laughs> so we have one last question. Um, will you share with us two or three of the most important things that the medical community needs to know to take good care of people from your faith tradition? I'm sorry? Two or three th of the most important things for medical people, the medical community to know, to take good care of someone from your faith tradition. <coughs> Uh, so for the Chinese religion, uh, especially the Taoism, I would like to share about uh, what the medical community need to know. Uh, because I got into Taoism, so uh, death is not something the end of the life, but is a change of the life, the, fo uh, the form change of the life. So in this perspective, I think uh, the medical community needed to respect the family decision of giving up medicalization. So if a family uh, knows that uh, there is uh, no help for, the, uh, uh, for being killed at this moment, technology. So if the family uh, decided to give up medicalization and uh, bring the patient back to home, and uh, I think is uh, uh, the patient, uh, the medical community needed to respect uh, the family's decision. And there's a very famous story about a uh, uh, Chinese Taoist uh, sage that uh, uh, his name is Zhuang Zi. And uh, uh, when his wife is dead, so his disciples thought they shall be grieving about uh, the death of the, uh, the, the teacher's wife. But when he go to the home of uh, Zhuang Zi, uh, he found that Zhuang Zi is very uh, dancing <coughs> and singing a song uh, to say that uh, good for his wife, because his wife has go back to nature and uh, go back to the cycle of the big Tao. So uh, I think uh, to respect uh, that the decision. But here I am just a little cautious about uh, uh, why should the medical community need to know about uh, the rituals? Because I think it put much burden on the medical community. So if the, the doctors needed to know about so many rituals, for example, uh, if a Chinese uh, person is near to death, it's better to give uh, a kind of uh, rice, a piece of rice into the, uh, the, the people's uh, mouth to say that he, is, he has some food to go through the, uh, the path to the hill. But I do not think this is very necessary for the medical doctor because there are so many rituals needed for, uh, uh, for, uh, for that person in that religious tradition. So if we ask the doctor to know so much rituals, so I think it will just give too much burden to the doctors. Thank you. <coughs> well, there's a number of things I'd like to share. Um, I guess, uh, we would really focus in on it's important to know the individual. We can't pigeonhole or generalize to the point of saying, okay, you're a Christian, therefore you want this, or you're a Taoist, and therefore you must that, or you're a Muslim, therefore you must. So we gotta, every, even within all the religions, every person we need to deal with is on an individual basis, because everybody has their own perspective and point of view. So I think that's an important thing. So everything you hear tonight, Understand these are generalizations. 
but each person is unique and each person is important and we need to deal with each individual in a unique way. And that's part of the Christian tradition. We see Jesus dealt with people as individuals. Now he fed the 5,000, but he didn't heal the 5,000. Right? He did each one one-on-one. -on -one. And everyone was unique, depending upon the person's area of need of healing. There's four kinds of healing that Jesus did. And depending upon the kind of healing, he would then promote that kind of healing touch or that healing care. And so we need to value the importance and, and respect the rights of the patient or the individual. Uh, Christians would, would advance directives are very important. I think it's for us, we'd want to make sure patients think through uh, what they would desire for each person. And whether that's an advanced directive or, or a will, uh, will and testament, um, and understand the protocol of that succession in, in, in U.S. culture or, or Christian culture, especially, we would say it would be if a person dies, the patients, of, of course, would be the one to determine the kind uh, and type of care. But if that person isn't able, then the spouse. And if that person, if the spouse isn't able, it would be the children. If it's not the children, then it would be parents if they're still alive. If not, it would be the siblings. If not, it would be maybe nieces or nephews. So you need to understand the protocol, and that's how we'd want to be, you know, understanding of the whole family, that the whole family is involved in the grief and loss process. And I, and I think Christianity has really been kind of a, a leader in that, uh, the whole nursing side of things, from our founders, Catherine McCauley and the Sisters of Mercy, who were in Ireland back in 1831, uh, how they formed that, and, and then they worked with Florence Nightingale on how she really became the mother of modern nursing. And I think uh, in Christianity, we see the nursing science and, and art is, is really developed. And so uh, it's important to, to embrace the whole medical team. It's not just the doctor, but it's the whole team. Um, and we need to understand, too, there, there are certain legal and ethical religious directives. And one thing the Catholic uh, Church and the Catholic uh, healthcare has are the, uh, they call them the uh, ERDs, or the Ethical <coughs> Religious Directives for Catholic Health Care Services. And this is by the bishops uh, of America put this together. So it provides some guidelines uh, uh, for, for caring. And there are ethics committees uh, in, I know, Catholic hospitals, and I think in others as well, Lutheran and, and Methodist hospitals. Uh, but again, it's the priority of the rights of the patient needs to be respected. And I guess the biggest challenges I think we face, and I think we would all face here to some degree, uh, is the increased secularization uh, of, of our culture, whatever that may be. I think we're facing a lot in America, and especially the, the decreased faith-basedness of our point of view or our worldview. And that will affect spirituality. It'll affect how our religious uh, understandings. As well as then the second thing would be the legal encroachments that, that can happen in any culture and that there we're being directed by, uh, by the laws. And laws uh, can cause a person's religious li liberties or our religious convictions to be compromised. And that's where I think the encroachment of, of some of the medical um, practices maybe could, could really impinge on that. So I think those are two things I think are important considerations and maybe a possibility for future panel discussions to really deal with some of those issues because we're seeing that more and more every day. And we want to respect the diversity, obviously, because we care about every person as unique. But we also understand that there has to be a sense of, of, of respect and commonality of that. And so um, th those are some things that I'd like to mention that I think are important. I couldn't agree more with my, my colleagues uh, that have said that uh, it's really important to um, consider the views of the family. And that's all the more important uh, for the Hindu patients uh, because really, again, the traditions change from family to family. Some families may want the final rites to be performed in a certain way. Other families may want those final rites performed in an entirely different way. You may have heard that cremation is very common for Hindus. But I can also give you examples where Hindu, uh, very believing, staunch Hindus prefer burial. So 
it is really the, the family tradition, the family uh, belief that uh, the, the medical community uh, needs to respect. And I'm very, very happy to say this uh, over the last 25 years that I've lived in Iowa. Um, <coughs> it has been a wonderful experience to see both the medical community as well as uh, the uh, community or the businesses that, uh, that support the after, uh, after the death um, processes. Uh, the funeral homes, for example. They have been very sensitive, they've been very respectful of the traditions, and they've been very, very you know, considerate to the point that they have probably broken some laws. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll just give you one, one simple example. In many Hindu families, it is traditional to have a lamp, a lit lamp, uh, with an oil a lamp with a little cotton wick in it uh, to be left by the uh, by the dead body, and after the dead body is removed, also it's left there for some time, and that that time changes depending on the tradition and the family. But lamp, that's the sign uh, of the life that used to be. And funeral homes have been very accommodating by allowing a, a lamp in open space like that, which is not not legal. <laughs> so, um, I think I think to the, to the point that the sensitivity has increased to the point that they just don't want to be disrespectful. They want to help the family, especially at that time, as much as possible. And, and I'm very proud to say that Iowans have been very, very considerate for most uh, examples that I know of. Um, I, I think that um, the, the families have also learned a lot. Uh, one of the things that most families in Sistan uh, is um, having some sort of a chanting go on that has the name of the god, some sort of a music or whatever. And I, I have personally experienced this also in a, another example at Mercy at, uh, as well, uh, where they just did not have anybody to do the chanting. And then they simply asked the family, hey, what can we do, how can we help? Uh, they called me. Uh, whatever little I knew, I was able to chant. Uh, but again, um, this was probably not very uh, legal to have a stranger be in the ICU, ICU who is not medically trained to be with the person. But that's what the family wanted, and they respected that. So I think I think we have come a long way uh, on both sides. Um, that's that's all I would say. I've answered your question, Ram. I'll give you some good examples of what we have gone through. Because in Christianity, we have so many things. In Muslim, we have so many sects. Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't want blood. So now we are in the dilemma of saving the child, giving the blood. Yes, I have gone to court to get orders to give the blood. I have done that. Now. I had one child, Jehovah's Witness, born with a heart condition, got to be operated on. The parents said, no blood. Well, what do you do? So Philip and Zeph, you remember them? I went and talked to them, and they, the, both the surgeon, cardiac surgeon, they looked at me, said, you're a nut. What, what is it nonsense, no blood and your heart surgery? I said, listen, these are Jehovah's Witnesses. We got to respect them, what, what they are. Can you do it? No. Then we went on and anyway, to make the story short, Philip said, okay, on one condition, we'll do it. But if the time come, need the blood, we'll give it. Then I talked to the parents, thank God they didn't have the blood. The second patient was with a tight skull, and I have to operate on him. Nobody will do it without blood. So I called Loma Linda in California. They agreed, they did it. Believe me, I don't know why I am a Muslim. I almost became Jehovah's Witness. So they were all came to me. They all brought their books. And it was so, so great. So these are the things we go through. Another good example. Uh, <laughs> Sunday morning, six, or six week old baby, we had uh, some problems. So I listened to mom. I, I know, sometime we know what's going on. So I said, I'll meet you in the emergency room. 
So I go there, I saw the baby, baby has to be operated on right away. My lot of stenosis, you know, tightness here. Baby cannot eat. So I said, operate. And the young parents, oh my God. I said, no, that's okay. Baby's going to be okay. They said, no, that's not it. We are Catholics. This is a Methodist hospital. <laughs> okay, so I called the nurse, called the priest. The priest was showing up, and then I called Dr. Wolf, who is a surgeon, Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes, examined the baby, he said, yep, we got to operate. And we, when you came out, we didn't realize it's the nurses in the emergency room rolling with laughter. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with you guys? They said, did you notice what happened? A Methodist patient, a mercy, uh, Catholic patient, Methodist hospital, Muslim pediatrician, and a Jewish surgeon blessed. This, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is taken care of the God. So these are the things that look like medical, but the parents' sentiments at that time are so important. You know, it's very easy for us to say, do this, do this, but no, you have to feel their feelings what they have to go through. Now, one last thing which is a little tough, Dr. Albert, you remember Marian Albert? I was covering another doctor. I was called at Mercy Hospital that one of his patients is deadly sick. Rush out there, we resuscitated the child, 12 years, 13 years, very physically handicapped child. Came out, and parents lived in Newton, Iowa. We had called them, they came in, so here, great doctor, comes out and say, he's doing okay, he's just fine, he's breathing now. <sighs> the father looked at me and said, thank you doctor for prolonging our misery. So see, the thing is there's nothing wrong with that, but see that handicapped child in that condition, parents have suffered for 12 years and you come and save the life. So that, that's my medical profession. We go through these things. So decision making between parents and the families are so important in your everyday. So even though we gave you broad, tough questions and gave you very short amounts of time to answer, I think you've given a lot of really helpful information to the group. Thank you.